This is Stephen Platinum, your friend in wrestling, with a very special kind of thing. It's Platinum versus the Countdown to Revolution. Revolution is the AEW pay-per-view taking place this Sunday, which I will be at live. Um, I've looked at almost all of these kind of countdown shows, some of the Road 2 shows, and this one um, was really tightly done. Um, they, they get into this good rhythm. And again, keep in mind, this is programming on TNT. This took place the hour after a very successful Dynamite. And, um, and I mean, there were commercial breaks and all of this. So this was legit programming. And it definitely lived up to that from a production standpoint, right? We set up some of the major stories that we were going to see. Um, they got into Moxley and Omega. They're going to get into the Bucks and Jericho and MJF. This is right at the top of the program, right? They, they're going to talk about Paige against Hardy. They're going to talk about that ladder match featuring six people. And they're going to talk about Darby and Sting versus Cage and Starks. So they let us know right from the jump, here's why you would want to buy this thing, right? Um, and keep in mind, all right, let's say Dynamite generously may get a million because of because of the Sha Shaquille O'Neal thing. Um, let's just say that they get around the 800,000 mark, and that's being conservative, right? Let's say they get 800,000. Let's say that only 12.5% of the people. No, like that's not realistic. Let's say 25% of that audience stays, right? That's probably closer to reality. So you're looking at 200,000 people now. Um, and if they're gonna watch this whole thing, what are the chances that they're gonna order the pay-per-view? Pretty freaking high. Um, again, this is kind of no-lose programming for TNT instead of running often they will run a movie as a lead into dynamite and then they'll repeat that movie afterwards this is certainly better than that right um the first story they really start building and again they gotta go back to these things again and again and again from different angles i gotta say the use of tony shivani and um excalibur and jim ross in this thing these things are really good the kind of cutaway interviews were much better than previous. I thought Chris Jericho in particular was really sensational at really putting over kind of a difficult thing because that match on the surface, you could say, is kind of slapdash, but they've made something out of nothing in effect. And Jericho really does a great job here on the microphone, much better than MJF. Like MJF is about putting himself over and that works, but Jericho is really telling a story and really laying it out there how they could very well beat the box and how everything they've done to lead to this point has been strategy to defeat the Bucks. And I thought it was just great. And, you know, the kind of thing that Jericho does really, really well. And I think he doesn't get enough credit for that. But the first story that we delve into a little bit is how the company was to be built around Omega, but Moxley is the one who came in, stole his thunder, beat him up, and then ended up winning the title. And then Omega's had to deal with these questions, according to him, of like, where's the cleaner? When are you going to finally take your time, take your moment? And he's like, now I've got it. Then we cut to the Bucks, who, you know, it's a similar story, right? We're, we were going to, you know, here we are at this, this on the, at this podium saying how we're going to build the best tag team division in the world. And then, you know, we lost to two singles wrestlers, right, in Omega and Page. Now, that match is considered maybe the greatest tag team match of all time, and that's great, but now here they are again, as they said it, um, you know, two singles wrestlers sort of thrown together. That's sort of the Bucks attempting to dismiss Jericho and MJF. Then we get a third story here where uh, Darby loses to Cody again and again and again, but then finally becomes the face of, and then Taz offers to help him, and he rebuffs that help. 
Um, and then so Taz then becomes obsessed with Darby, who claims that Darby is obsessed with him. And then Sting gets involved. So we've set up three really different and interesting stories. We go to commercial and then we come back. We show Sting arriving in AEW and what a great moment that was. And lots of people talk about that and how the connection between Sting and Darby, how he's there for Darby. Um, and also because he has something to prove. These stand-up interviews, um, I thought Sting and Jericho really stole it, really did a fantastic job in totally different ways. Sting felt very down-to-earth, sort of, you know, the way that AEW so blithely can just talk about WWE and other things, it's really wonderful, and just the use of Getting footage from Impact to use for Sting, I thought was really cool. Again, it's just AEW is doing something WWE is not, which is they're capturing the elusive thing of cool, right? And you can't really explain it. You just know it when somebody's got it. And right now they really got it. Um, Taz is sort of taking this position of Sting and Darby fight dirty, uh, but we can take it to the streets and a street fight favors us. Um, then we get this promo with Darby and Sting where Darby sort of like throws his skateboard through the window because I'm a hoodlum. And Sting looks confused, it seems, but then he beats up a bunch of panes of glass with his bat and he goes like, I'm a hoodlum too. Um, and then we show the clips of Taz and his crew dragging Darby behind their car. And then we're going to go to commercial break. And when we come back and they do, and they do this really well too. When they go to commercial break, they talk about what they're going to talk about next. They're going to address Paige Hardy. They're going to talk about this ladder match and the young bucks and uh, Omega and Moxley. And then those, that, that those things will whittle down by one every time they go to commercial break. And again, it's just constantly selling the different matches and stories of the pay-per-view. It's just, it's meat and potatoes, but it's just done so well. And again, you know, I, I would say like Impact slash TNA did have moments years ago where they had great sort of innovations or great ideas of stuff they would do to sell. Um, but they were never that successful at it. They can never string together a whole thing. Here, AEW is clearly interested in promoting the stories and selling the pay-per-view based on those stories. In addition to the very obvious, like, spectacle gimmick of the, you know, exploding ring barbed wire death match. Right. But they save that for the end, mostly. So we come back and uh, we get Bucks versus Jericho and MGF and, and different angles of the story. Right. They really delve into this idea of the Bucks kind of coming up short until they didn't. And now Jericho, Jericho is just oozing confidence, just like, of course, we can beat them. Of course, we're going to beat them. Yeah. Uh, we talk about the ladder match just a little bit. Just again, they keep touching on these stories like a skipping stone again and again and again, reiterating, right? Advertising. People have to hear things three times in order they and for them to go for something. So they're making sure whatever story interests you, you're going to hear about it in little ways again and again and again. Slightly different angles, slightly different facets to the jewel. Um, we talk about Moxley and Omega again a little bit. And uh, when we go into the commercial break, we're, we said we're going to go, we're going to dive into Matt Hardy and uh, Adam Page. When they come back, they sort of set up this dichotomy between Omega as a finesse wrestler and Mox as the battler. And then we jump into the Page thing. And I'd say Page is right there with Jericho and right there with Sting. His moments are really great. He talks about how he loved the Hardys. They show all this stuff from the Omega promotion that the Hardys ran and how Paige was booked there. And he goes like $50. I think I got paid $50 and maybe Matt only paid me $25 to segue into this thing where Matt was trying to screw Paige out of money. They go into the story of Paige and the Dark Order and how he rejects them and then how Hardy, Hardy tries to screw him over. And then they have great voiceovers by... Excalibur and Jim Ross and other people who sort of explain, like, I think Paige just doesn't want to be screwed over anymore. And, and Hardy tried. Really great stuff. Really set up their match incredibly effectively. Now we're going to hone in on just a couple, like, two or three things now. 
We're going to come back and talk about the exploding barbed wire death match. And we're going to come back about who's going to be the face of the revolution by winning that TNT ladder match. I like that idea, who's the face of the revolution. We come back, we get into more Sting and Taz stuff. And it's really good. And they finally come to the conclusion after they show us different clips and different people opine about this thing and all the angles to it, that it's more than a match. It's about respect. Great, great, simple story to tell. This ladder match, um, Scorpio wants his break, right? And then you got Cody who wants to get back to the TNT championship and be the face of the company. Max Caster, Lance Archer, Penta. They talk a lot about Penta, which I think is really cool, about how he was the older brother and Ray Phoenix was the up-and-comer, but now it feels like Ray Phoenix has kind of stolen that thunder, And but this is Penta's chance. So everybody's got a different reason to win, which is what you want, right? realistically if you've got six people in there only three have a really respectable chance so if i had a guess on who that is i'd say it's cody i'd say it's lance archer and scorpio sky but i could see penta winning it as well i'd be really shocked if max caster won but then again all he's got to do is have a great showing that's what's great about matches like that we go to commercial break, our last one, and we're going to come back with Omega and Moxley. And boy, do they. They really dive into the everything Omega has done from cheating to win the title to the Good Brothers and the Bullet Club people being involved with Moxley. Um, and then they really dive into this exploding barbed wire death match. And they show the Japanese clips and Onita speaking and um Jim Ross saying, I don't really know anything about it except Terry Funk used to do them. And they really put over this idea of this hasn't been done in 25 years. And um, from everything that I've heard that this thing is fucking spectacular. So I am very much looking forward to it. And I got to say, this thing was a great piece of business. I'm sure TNT is really happy. It, it feels something that's like network station worthy. Um, and the people who put these clips together and put these interviews together and found these stories to tell and film things accordingly and, and kept up instead of just going like in this segment, we're going to talk about this match and in this segment, we're going to talk about this other match, the, the way they kind of danced around a little bit and then used each segment to dive in deep on one of them. But that doesn't mean they weren't mentioning them throughout. I think it was a very smart way to do it. We'll see what kind of numbers this translates to. Might as well make a prediction, right? Um, if AEW has been doing 100,000, this one will do 150,000 easily. And again, for those that think, oh, it's not that big of a deal. It's 50 bucks a pop, first of all. That's with a lot of pirating going on. They're getting 150,000 legitimate buys. And, and that's more than Impact or TNA ever did. At their greatest. The greatest drawing pay-per-view that they ever had was Angle Joe. And that didn't even crack six digits. I think it got 60,000 buys. AEW's never done that little. So for those of you who say like AEW's not viable and they just lose money. Buddy, they're doing the model that we're all familiar with. Right? Right? not too shabby and things like this give me a lot of hope i'm glad that they're continuing to tweak and modify to aew right now they're operating out of strength and it shows and we'll see can this pay-per-view possibly live up to the hype of this we're gonna find out <laughs> 